Whilst Gustavus had been campaigning in Poland, events in Europe had been evolving rapidly. In 1618, the conflict that would become known as the Thirty Years' War had broken out. Initially a religious dispute within the Holy Roman Empire, the various European states gradually became more invested as the brutal repression of Protestants by Emperor Ferdinand II ignited the powder keg of tensions that had been laid by the Protestant Reformation in Germany. Ferdinand, who was also the Habsburg ruler of Austria, was managing the internal crisis quite ably and enjoyed a series of military successes that he hoped would expand the influence of the Holy Roman Empire into a true German state in Central Europe. His capable general, Albrecht von Wallenstein, had, by 1630, begun to conquer German territories on the Baltic coast. This expansion of Catholic Habsburg power was enough to draw the Protestant Gustavus Adolphus into the war proper. On the 6th of July, 1630, a Swedish force of 23,000 men landed in Pomerania, but vacillated somewhat as to how best to assist the Protestant cause. Whilst Gustavus debated his course of action, Ferdinand, fearing the growing influence of his general, replaced Wallenstein with the ageing and inexperienced Johann Tilly. Tilly initially proceeded with a campaign against the city of Magdeburg, which Gustavus was unable to stop, allowing imperial forces to sack the city. Around 25,000 of its inhabitants were killed, and the city was left a smoking ruin. This atrocity spurred Gustavus into action. He first marched on Berlin and forced the Elector of Brandenburg to join his cause. As Tilly's forces ravaged Saxony, their excesses drove the Saxon ruler to also pledge his forces to Gustavus, providing him with 18,000 extra troops, albeit inexperienced ones. With his army now over 40,000 strong, Gustavus marched into Saxony to confront Tilly's forces at their encampment near the city of Leipzig. The imperial forces were poorly disciplined and relatively unprepared for a fierce battle, but Tilly's lieutenant, Gottfried zu Pappenheim, was eager to fight and persuaded his commander to deploy for battle. The imperial forces deployed on a plane outside Leipzig on the 17th of September 1631. Their forces were arrayed in 17 tercios of 1,500 to 2,000 men apiece in a broad line, with cavalry on either flank. Tilly only had 26 cannon, which he placed at the front and centre of his formation. The Swedes drew up opposite. They had the advantage of 51 heavy cannon, in addition to a further 24 light guns attached to their infantry regiments. The Swedish regular troops formed the right wing, whilst the inexperienced Saxons formed the left. Gustavus kept his cavalry on either flank, with 50-man platoons of musketeers hidden amongst the cavalry to protect against enemy horsemen, a tactic echoing Caesar's precautions at Pharsalus 16 centuries before. The first stage of the battle was a prolonged artillery duel, which the Swedish forces dominated. The Swedish advantage in guns allowed them to fire three times as many shots as the Imperial artillery could manage. Eventually, the impetuous Pappenheim, commander of the Imperial left wing, could take the pressure no longer. Without waiting for orders, he moved his 5,000 men forwards and attacked the Swedes. Cantering forwards under continued fire, he began a textbook caracol attack with his pistol-armed cavalry against the waiting Swedes. Gustavus precautionary deployment of his musketeers saw this attack smashed. As the Imperial cavalrymen trotted forwards to discharge their pistols, the rapid-firing Swedish muskets poured fire into the mass of horses. Each time Pappenheim's men approached, their losses became more pronounced, and upon their seventh retreat, the Swedish commander, Johann Boehner, judged that the time was right to counter-attack. The Swedish cavalry forces fell upon the reeling Germans and drove them from the field in disarray. When Pappenheim launched his presumptive attack, his opposite number on the imperial right saw this as a sign for a general advance and charged the mass of Saxon forces before him. The poorly trained Saxons put up no resistance to the mass of armoured horsemen bearing down upon them and fled the battle, suddenly exposing the flank of the stalwart Swedes. Tilly saw the advantage before him and brought his tercios into action. The imperial right wing advanced to the spot that the Saxons had vacated and turned to face the Swedish flank, whilst the cavalry that had routed the Saxons were to turn and engage the Swedish rear. His other forces moved up obliquely to support this flank attack, leaving the Swedish centre and right relatively unmolested. 
Had Gustavus been using tercios himself, his force would likely have been destroyed. But such was the flexibility of the Swedish army, he could respond to this calamity in short order. As the imperial forces advanced, Gustavus redeployed two brigades of infantry on his left to meet them. The light artillery attached to these regiments devastated the tightly packed Germans, with canister after canister tearing through their formations. Once the Imperials reached musket range, the disparity in forces only grew, and they reeled under sustained fire from the Swedes. As Tilly's forces faltered in their flank attack, Gustavus seized his opportunity. Sending his victorious cavalry to strike the rear of the Imperial formation and prevent their responding to his manoeuvres, Gustavus then personally led four infantry regiments into the centre of Tilly's lines. Capturing the Imperial artillery, which had been left behind in the general advance, the Swedes used their own guns to pour more fire into the rear of the Imperial forces. As the net tightened on the beleaguered tercios, their cohesion began to fail with the light guns of the Swedes raking them with canister and their own heavy guns hurling shot through their massed ranks, the losses became too much to bear. Tilly's forces simply shattered under the weight of fire, running for their lives from the onslaught of shot and sword. They left behind them around 13,000 casualties, of whom 7,000 were killed. 3,000 more men were captured by pursuing cavalry. The victory in the Battle of Breitenfeld demonstrated what could be achieved when weapons were used to their full potential. The great Swedish advantage in artillery and musketry was compounded by the archaic tactics used by their opponent, a disadvantage that King Gustavus exploited perfectly. The Swedish victory left the road to Vienna open to the Swedes. The Imperial army was a ruin, and no further serious opposition remained. But, like Hannibal before him, Gustavus was unwilling to risk a march on the capital. Instead, the Swedish forces withdrew to the Rhineland into safe winter quarters, granting Ferdinand time to raise new forces and strengthen his position. Despite the stunning Swedish victory, Gustavus had achieved next to nothing with this campaign season.